10. How consequentialism is indirectly self-defeating. Most of my claims could, with little change, cover one group of moral theories. These are the different versions of consequentialism, or C. C's central claim is C1. There is one ultimate moral aim, that outcomes be as good as possible. C applies to everything. Applied to acts, C claims both C2. What each of us ought to do is whatever would make the outcome best, and C3. If someone does what he believes will make the outcome worse, he is acting wrongly. I distinguish between what we have most reason to do and what it would be rational for us to do, given what we believe or ought to believe. We must now distinguish between what is objectively and subjectively right or wrong. This distinction has nothing to do with whether moral theories can be objectively true. The distinction is between what some theory implies, given one, what are or would have been the effects of what some person does or could have done, and two, what this person believes or ought to believe about these effects. It may help to mention a similar distinction. The medical treatment that is objectively right is the one that would in fact be best for the patient. The treatment that is subjectively right is the one that, given the medical evidence, it would be most rational for the doctor to prescribe. As this example shows, what it would be best to know is what is objectively right. The central part of a moral theory answers this question. We need an account of subjective rightness for two reasons. We often do not know what the effects of our acts would be, and we ought to be blamed for doing what is subjectively wrong. We ought to be blamed for such acts, even if they are objectively right. A doctor should be blamed for doing what was very likely to kill his patient, even if his act, in fact, saves his patient's life. In most of what follows, I shall use right, ought, good, and bad in the objective sense. But wrong will usually mean subjectively wrong, or blameworthy. Which sense I mean will often be obvious given the context. Thus, it is clear that, of the claims given above, C2 is about what we ought objectively to do, in C3 is about what is subjectively wrong. To cover risky cases, C claims C4. What we ought subjectively to do is the act whose outcome has the greatest expected goodness. In calculating the expected goodness of an act's outcome, the value of each possible good effect is multiplied by the chance that the act will produce it. The same is done with the disvalue of each possible bad effect. The expected goodness of the outcome is the sum of these values minus these disvalues. Suppose, for example, that if I go west, I have a chance of 1 in 4 of saving 100 lives, and a chance of 3 in 4 of saving 20 lives. The expected goodness of my going west, valued in terms of the number of lives saved, is 100 times 1 fourth plus 20 times 3 fourths, or 25 plus 15, or 40. Suppose next that, if I go east, I shall certainly save 30 lives. The expected goodness of my going east is 30 times 1, or 30. According to C4, I ought to go west, since the expected number of lives saved would be greater. Consequentialism covers not just acts and outcomes, but also our desires, dispositions, beliefs, emotions, the color of our eyes, the climate, and everything else. More exactly, C covers anything that could make outcomes better or worse. According to C, the best possible climate is the one that would make outcomes best. I shall again use motives, 
to cover both desires and dispositions. C claims C5. The best possible motives are those of which it is true that, if we have them, the outcome will be best. As before, possible means causally possible. And there would be many different sets of motives that would be in this sense best. There would be no other possible set of motives of which it could be true that, if we have this set, this outcome would be better. I have described some of the ways in which we can change our motives. C2 implies that we ought to try to cause ourselves to have, or to keep, any of the best possible sets of motives. More generally, we ought to change both ourselves and anything else in any way that would make the outcome better. If we believe that we could make such a change, C3 implies that failing to do so would be wrong. To apply C, we must ask what makes outcomes better or worse. The simplest answer is given by utilitarianism. This theory combines C with the following claim. The best outcome is the one that gives to people the greatest net sum of benefits minus burdens, or on the hedonistic version of this claim, the greatest net sum of happiness minus misery. There are many other versions of C. These can be pluralist theories, applying to several different principles about what makes outcomes better or worse. Thus, one version of C appeals both to the utilitarian claim and to the principle of equality. This principle claims that it is bad if, through no fault of theirs, some people are worse off than others. On this version of C, the goodness of an outcome depends both on how great the net sum of benefits would be, and on how equally the benefits and burdens would be distributed between different people. One of two outcomes might be better, though it involved a smaller sum of benefits, because these benefits would be shared more equally. A consequentialist could appeal to many other principles. According to three such principles, it is bad if people are coerced, deceived, and betrayed. And some of these principles may essentially refer to past events. Two such principles appeal to past entitlements and to just deserts. The principle of equality may claim that people should receive fair shares, not at particular times, but in the whole of their lives. If it makes this claim, this principle essentially refers to past events. If our moral theory contains such principles, we are not concerned only with consequences in the narrow sense, with what happens after we act, but we can still be, in a wider sense, consequentialists. In this wider sense, our ultimate moral aim is not that outcomes be as good as possible, but that history go as well as possible. What I say below could be restated in these terms. With the word consequentialism in the letter C, I shall refer to all these different theories. As with the different theories about self-interest, it would take at least a book to decide between these different versions of C. This book does not discuss this decision. I discuss only what these different versions have in common. My arguments and conclusions would apply to all, or nearly all, the plausible theories of this kind. It is worth emphasizing that if a consequentialist appeals to all of the principles I have mentioned, his moral theory is very different from utilitarianism. Since such theories have seldom been discussed, this is easy to forget. Some have thought that if consequentialism appeals to many different principles, it ceases to be a distinctive theory, since it could be made to cover all moral theories. This is a mistake. C appeals only to principles about what makes outcomes better or worse. Thus, C might claim that it would be worse if there was more deception or coercion. C would then give to all of us two common aims. We should try to cause it to be true that there is less deception or coercion. 
Since C gives to all agents common moral aims, I shall call C agent neutral. Many moral theories do not take this form. These theories are agent relative, giving to different agents different aims. It can be claimed, for example, that each of us should have the aim that he does not coerce other people. On this view, it would be wrong for me to coerce other people, even if by doing so, I could cause it to be true that there would be less coercion. Similar claims might be made about deceiving or betraying others. On these claims, each person's aim should be not that there be less deception or betrayal, but that he himself does not deceive or betray others. These claims are not consequentialist. And these are the kinds of claim that most of us accept. C can appeal to principles about betrayal and deception, but it does not appeal to these principles in their familiar form. I shall now describe a different way in which some theory T might be self-defeating. Call T indirectly, collectively self-defeating when it is true that if several people try to achieve their T given aims, these aims will be worse achieved. On all or most of its different versions, this may be true of C. C implies that we should always try to do whatever would make the outcome as good as possible. If we are disposed to act in this way, we are pure do-gooders. If we were all pure do-gooders, this might make the outcome worse. This might be true even if we always did what of the acts that were possible for us would make the outcome best. The bad effects might come not from our acts, but from our disposition. There are many ways in which, if we were all pure do-gooders, this might have bad effects. One is the effect on the sum of happiness. On any plausible version of C, happiness is a large part of what makes outcomes better. Most of our happiness comes from having and acting upon certain strong desires. These include the desires that are involved in loving certain other people, the desire to work well, and many of the strong desires on which we act when we are not working. To become pure do-gooders, we would have to act against or even to suppress most of these desires. It is likely that this would enormously reduce the sum of happiness. This would make the outcome worse even if we always did what of the acts that were possible for us made the outcome best. It might not make the outcome worse than it actually is, given what people are actually like, but it would make the outcome worse than it would be if we were not pure do-gooders, but had certain other causally possible desires and dispositions. There are several other ways in which, if we were all pure do-gooders, this might make the outcome worse. One rests on the fact that when we want to act in certain ways, we shall be likely to deceive ourselves about the effects of our acts. We shall be likely to believe, falsely, that these acts will produce the best outcome. Consider, for example, killing other people. If we want someone to be dead, it is easy to believe falsely that this would make the outcome better. It therefore makes the outcome better that we are strongly disposed not to kill, even when we believe that doing so would make the outcome better. Our disposition not to kill should give way only when we believe that by killing, we would make the outcome very much better. Similar claims applied to coercion, deception, and several other kinds of acts.